Hi there, in this project I'm going to use and modify a PSphere PZEM-004T module. This project uses mains voltage and if you are following along you do so at your own risk. Following a suggestion from Eric, one of my viewers, I'm going to take an in-depth look at the PSphere PZEM-004T module. Slightly confusing, there are several versions you can buy. A 10 amp version uses a shunt resistor while the 100 amp version has two choices of current transformer, one that is split to open and one that is closed. You may further add a serial to USB cable into the mix. I decided to pick the most commonly chosen variant, the 100 amp version with a split transformer and I added the USB cable. Costs were just below $12 from Banggood in January but the module and the variants are also widely available from other sources on the internet. It arrived about two weeks after ordering in a nice little box. Inside were the comparatively huge current transformer, the USB cable and the module itself in a blue transparent case together with quite reasonable instructions. The instructions consist of this double page. The rear contains presumably the same in Chinese. Apologies regarding the quality, I scanned this in and this is the best I could manage. There are three sections. The specs on the left, the description of the Modbus-like interface in the middle and wiring instructions on the right. The claimed specs are voltage with 0.1 volt resolution and 0.5% accuracy starting from 80 volts. Current has 1 milliamp resolution and also 0.5% accuracy. The difference between the 10 amp and 100 amp version is the maximum current of course and the minimum current needed to get things going. In a 10 amp version that is 10 milliamps and in the 100 amp version 20 milliamps. For both the resolution of 1 milliamp is the same. This is quite good so you're not really penalized with terrible resolution by choosing the 100 amp current transformer version plus there's no overheating of shunt resistors. The active or real power is calculated based on the measured power factor. Power factor has a resolution of 0.01 and 1% accuracy which is quite good but hard to verify. Finally, the frequency is measured from 45 to 65 Hz at 0.5%. It does accumulate energy and you can set a maximum power value which when exceeded causes an alarm bit to be set in one of the registers. And speaking of those, to read or set the registers, the module uses a serial interface using TTL levels with pretty standard parameters as you can see. The protocol uses the Modbus interface standard and the instructions assume you are at least half familiar with it. If you have used it before or read some of the online documents on Modbus, it's pretty simple. I made a little Python command line program that reads the data from the module and locks it into a CSV file for use in a spreadsheet program. You can download that and the GUI version from my GitHub page, links in the description. Anyway, you can see the available registers here. The documentation contains quite a number of byte strings of example messages which should help you getting the interpretation and check some calculation right. One last note on the protocol, there is a calibration message but that is of little help as the spec does not say what voltages and currents are supposed to be applied to the module when this message is sent. Finally we have the wiring diagram. Note that the wiring is very different for the 10 amp version on top here and the 100 amp version below. It is very important to be clear what version your module is and get that right or you will short circuit your main circuit with predictable effects. For the 10 amp version, the current is flowing through the shunt resistor inside the module. This means all the wiring needs to be able to handle the 10 amp current. For the version with the current transformer, all you need to do is feed one of the wires to the load through the core of the transformer. In a split version, you don't even have to break the circuit, all you do is clip the transformer around the wire. Then you need two separate wires to tap the mains voltage to power the module and let it measure the voltage. These wires carry practically no current and can be the thinnest mains rated cables you can find. The transformer that came with my unit has a split core, which means it can be opened to clip around a wire without having to break it. 
For the closed version, you need to break the wire first, stick it through the hole in the transformer and then reconnect it. The diameter of the hole can accommodate cables with about 15 mm diameter, which should work for most tails that lead from an electricity meter to the distribution board of a residential property. The interface cable is of course not a simple USB type. Instead, embedded within the plug is the very common serial interface chip PL2303 from Prolific, although as it reports a serial number of zero, it might well be a clone. The chip handles USB signals on one side and TTL compatible serial RX and TX signals on the other side, together with 5 volts and ground. The module is nicely tucked away inside its plastic case. The green screw terminals on the left are for the connection to mains voltage and the current transformer, while the white 4 pin socket is the serial interface. Of course, that means the first question is whether the serial port is isolated from mains. Let's break it open to find out. Although it's just clipped together, it's a very tight fit and quite a struggle, even with a spudger to get it out. I did break a few of the tiny hooks in the process, but it's still usable. If you do this and plan to put it back into the box, as I did, I advise to use more than one spudger and to really go slow and careful. Anyway, now that it's out, let's take a good look. The large yellow block is a 470 nanofarad capacitor rather stingingly rated for only 275 volts AC. As this is for a capacitor dropper to power the module for mains, that rating is worryingly close to what I sometimes see as AC voltage in the UK, around 240 volts is normal, 245 occasional. The two white blocks are indeed optocouplers and the separation would be excellent except this corner here where there is just a 3 mm gap between mains reference C7 and R8, which is part of the serial interface. If only they had just moved C7 slightly higher or R8 lower. There's room to do that. Sometimes you just have to wonder what they were thinking. As you can see, the separation on the underside is flawless. On the far side, they even made a separation slot between the two pins that carry life and neutral. That is a rare sight and pretty good. First step in any teardown, remove any warranty void or QC stickers. Revealing the brain, which is a V9881D from Vango, a single phase energy metering system on chip. The other P-Sphere power meter had a chip of the same family. The V98XX family of chips is pretty complex. The main difference of the V9881D compared to the other versions is that it has no LCD display driver and less flash memory. It retains the complex analog front end, power management, 8052 CPU core and serial port. I won't go into the details of the signal processing that's going on here, but since I'm going to do some modifications, it's important to briefly explain the power management. The main supply voltage can be 5 volts or 3.3 volts, which is fed here at VDD5. This voltage is available to other 5 volt circuitry here and for stuff needing 3.3 volts, an internally generated 3.3 volt output is here. Of course, if the input is already 3.3 volts, as is the case in this module, the output on both is 3.3 volts. The point of these outputs is that the chip provides power management and can control when these voltages are available. This allows the chip to power down not only itself, but its supporting circuitry as well for an exceptionally low power usage during sleep. Sleep and power down is controlled by the power monitor depending on what it sees on its VDC in pin here. I did a complete reverse engineering of the PCB to come up with this schematic, which you can download from my GitHub page, link in the description. It may look confusing, but it's actually pretty straightforward if you take it function by function. Let's start with how the chip gets powered. Mains live and neutral come in from here. Neutral is directly connected to the common ground on the board. This is not earth. Mains earth plays no part in this circuit. Life goes through a capacitor dropper in form of that big yellow capacitor C15 with a discharge resistor R15 across it. This is fed via a 100 ohm resistor directly into a 12 volt Zener diode. Very unusual. 
it does not go through a rectifier diode first. Instead, the single halfway rectifier comes after the CNET diode. The effect of this arrangement is that current flows through the capacitor dropper, the 100 ohm resistor and the Zener in both halfways, although only the positive halfway is used to do something useful, namely to top up the big 470 microfarad electrolytic capacitor E4 to plus 12 volts. The negative halfway is converted into heat in the Zener diode and the resistor. What a terribly wasteful circuit. The smooth 12 volts is then further filtered by the smaller capacitor and fed into a 3.3 volt regulator. The output of the 3.3 volts is then smoothed further with C14 and a 10 microfarad capacitor before going into the chip's VDD5 input. It is also used to light LED D4 which is completely buried under the large yellow dropper capacitor. The two power outputs provided by the chip are not used but terminated anyway as recommended in the datasheet with 10 microfarad smoothing and filter capacitors. The power manager in the chip is getting its input from this resistor divider, a 12 volt that provides VDC in with about 1.5 volts which is sufficient to signal normal operation. The next function is measuring mains voltage and amps. Neutral is already connected to the chip via the common ground. Life goes through a voltage divider of roughly 1 to 1000 consisting of the 1 meg ohm R17 and R16 of just 750 ohms. The output of the divider is filtered by C1 and connected to the chip's volts measuring input pin. The current transformer is connected to pin 1 and 2. It is terminated by a 50 milli ohm resistor and connected to the chip's first set of current inputs using 100 ohm resistors and a couple of filter capacitors. The second set of current inputs are not used. We are almost there. The serial interface is easy to understand and TX and RX have each their own LED to monitor the signal state. Note that this interface relies on plus 5 volt and ground being provided as well. The RX input needs to be pulled to ground to light the monitor LED and the one in the optocoupler. Similar, the TX output is normally high and pulled to ground by the phototransistor in the optocoupler which then lights the TX monitor LED as well. On the high voltage side, the optocouplers are driven or monitored by the chip serial port. Here's a view of what is hiding under the big yellow capacitor. You can see the red Zener diode next to the normal one. The black thing in the foreground is the 7133-1 regulator for the 3.3 volts. The large resistor in the back is the 100 ohm limiting the current through the Zener diode. You can see the power on LED D4 which is normally hidden. Another object almost completely hidden is the 50 milli ohm resistor R18 terminating the current transformer. It is mounted directly under the 100 ohm resistor. Here's another view of the 50 milli ohm R18 being dwarfed by the large 100 ohm resistor needed to waste all that energy. Here you can see R17 which is the 1 meg ohm resistor that forms part of the volts measuring circuit. It's a tiny SMD type which is very unsafe since these resistors are not rated to withstand mains voltage. Better designs use a string of resistors in series to limit the voltage drop across each to safe levels. With all the knowledge gathered, this leaves us with these options. Leave the original and use as is. This is the obvious thing to do if you are not comfortable doing the modifications I am going to do. The only slight danger is that the tiny 1 meg ohm resistor may eventually fail which would destroy the chip, but the optocoupler interface should save your connected Raspberry Pi, Arduino or PC. Option 1 is to make it measure from 0 volts upwards. This means we need to separate the mains power feeding the chip from the measurement interface. This is a relative simple operation but of course involves mains voltage, so don't do it unless you are familiar with the necessary precautions. The second and most extreme option includes option 1 but goes further to remove a separate mains power connection to feed the chip because it will take its power directly from USB. This is the modification I am going to show and success and your safety depends crucially on getting the right components to do this properly. For those who want to do only option 1, since option 2 includes this, I cover it too. 
you just have to stop at the right point. To separate the power supply input from the measurement input, all we have to do is remove this connection here and connect the voltage to be measured to the now disconnected leg of the 1 meg ohm resistor. For example, in a variac setup, you would connect the incoming mains to the live and neutral pins of the existing connector, but connect the 1 meg ohm resistor to the output of the variac. Then you can measure voltages down to zero. There's no need to change anything on the current side. Current measurements just continues to work as before. When doing that modification, we should also remove the PUNI 1 meg ohm resistor and replace it with one that can handle mains voltage, or alternatively with a couple of smaller resistors in series that make up 1 meg ohm. This reduces the voltage top across each individual resistor to safer levels. In my build, I have used resistors from TE Connectivity and VSHE simply based on the fact what was available and least expensive. It seems resistors that can stand 350 volts are in general slightly larger 0.6 watt types. The standard 1 quarter watt types only go to 200 volts. So when going resistor shopping for things connected directly to mains, it pays to examine the data sheets for the permitted operating voltage. This is how the modified schematic would look like for option 1. I have replaced the 1 meg ohm SMD resistor R17 with two through-hole resistors in series, R17A and R17B. Each of these alone would be sufficient in terms of voltage rating, but two in series is obviously even better. There is however another more pressing need for using two resistors to replace R17. If you add my replacement values up, you find the total just 980k. The reason is that the original 1 meg ohm R17 in my unit was actually only 978k. The trouble is that this unit was obviously calibrated in the factory with this resistor and lacking the calibration procedure, we have no choice but to get replacements that match this value as close as possible. If you just replace R17 with an actual 1 meg ohm equivalent resistor, you would underread the voltage by 2.2%. If you want to follow along, first measure the value of R17 before removing it. Do this when nothing else is connected to the unit. Then see if you can find an equivalent resistor pair or possibly three resistors in series, keeping in mind that your replacement resistors also have tolerances. Since you have to buy at least 10 resistors of each value anyway, you can usually pick those that in combination come closest to the desired value. If you don't want to go through this trouble, you can just leave the 1 meg ohm and reuse it, despite the questionable safety. You will have to cut two PCB traces and add a patch wire in that case. I decided against using an additional trim pot to get the value exactly. To mount this trimmer reasonably safe would be tricky and adjusting it safely would require a safe source of relatively high AC voltage and a complete isolated adjustment tool. Many folks won't have these things and without, the danger of getting a lethal shock during the adjustment is just too high. Modifying the PCB for just option 1 while keeping the original R17 is not easy because the tracking question is shared with R15, which is the discharge resistor for the capacitor dropper. We have to cut this track and also the connection between R17 and R15 and then use an isolated jump wire, shown in yellow, to reconnect R15 to the cut track, but higher up. This yellow jump wire carries the full live mains voltage, so it needs to stay clear of anything else. Last not least, a new wire, shown here in light blue, is needed to connect the dangling end of R17 to a new terminal for voltage measurement. If you replace R17, you don't have to mess around as much on the PCB. Just desolder R17 or use snips to cut it off and connect R16 somehow to your new replacement resistors R17A and R17B. Of course, these are also at live mains voltage, so exercise the necessary caution in wiring and mounting these resistors. For option 2, I removed rather a lot more components. Two key things that definitely have to go are the diode D1 and capacitors E4. By removing D1, we disconnect the input of the voltage regulator from the capacitor dropper circuit. 
We need to maintain the 12 volt side because that's where the chip's power management gets its clues from. The big electrolytic smoothing capacitors it needs to go because it draws a huge inrush current at startup almost like a short circuit, which can overwhelm the new USB power supply. I considered replacing it with a smaller value, but it's not necessary because there isn't anything to smooth, and the 10 microfarad capacitors at the 3 volt sides are taking care of whatever ripple may get through. Since we will be powering from the USB serial port, it makes sense to remove the now unnecessary capacitive dropper. Firstly, it consumes a lot of power, and also the voltage rating of C15 is just borderline for a 240 volt country. Removal of C15 also makes its discharge resistor R15 unnecessary, and by its removal we can conveniently free the original live terminal of the connector to be our voltage measurement input. For the same reason, the now unused big 100 ohm resistor needs to go, because we need the space for the new R17B resistor. And finally, removal of the lone Zener diode makes space to ease the mounting of the new isolated DC to DC converter. The complete option 2 schematic is here. You can see the reuse of the live terminal as measurement input. The new thing is the isolated DC to DC converter that takes 5 volts from the USB serial interface and converts it to 12 volts which is fed into the input circuitry of the regulator. For this to be safe, it is crucial that an isolating DC to DC converter is selected. The usual types are only good for 1 kV and not meant to be permanently across high voltage differences as needed in this circuit. So although they are isolating and may work for a while, don't use these here. After quite a bit of searching, I found this type here. It isolates to 6.4 kV, tested for 1 second and 1 minute on 3.2 kV. This is way better than most isolating DC to DC converters I found and it should hopefully handle 250V AC continuously, although the manufacturers do not give any guarantees. This is one of the reasons why the other protection method of using good quality resistors for R17 is so important. They will limit the maximum fault current to 0.3 mA. The R05P12S type I got is converting 5 volts to 12 volts for a maximum of 84 mA of current. This is more than enough as the circuit draws less than 10 mA at 12 volts. The problem is that this converter is not able to withstand a short circuit in the output for more than one second, so great care has to be taken to get the wiring right as this converter alone costs as much as the whole module. Note the maximum capacitive load of 470 microfarad. This was exactly the value of the large electrolytic smoothing capacitors E4. But there are three further 10 microfarad capacitors in the 3.3 volt side, so you can now understand why E4 had to go. Here is the board with all components unnecessary for option 2 already removed. You will notice a couple of wires I have attached. They are ground and plus 5 volts from the USB serial interface which are simply tacked on to the corresponding connector pins. Here is my idea on how to arrange the new components. Because there is now sufficient space and available pads, some even with holes, I plan to arrange R17A and R17B like that. The DC to DC converter basically sits where the dropper capacitor was with some improvised mounting. That way the modified board will even fit back into the original case. The 12 volt output of the DC to DC converter conveniently attaches to the pads where the electrolytic capacitor used to be. The thin wires already attached to the USB connector will fold over the other way and run double isolated to the input of the converter. The two new resistors R17A and R17B to replace R17 the 1 megohm that isn't 1 megohm are installed. Because R17B has the 0.05 ohm resistor for the current shunt underneath, I decided to put them in some transparent heat shrink sleeving for extra protection. The DC to DC converter sits on a white piece of ABS plastic held with double sided tape. This serves as a bit of extra isolation. 
The white ABS board is raised slightly off the PCB components using these adhesive pads that fit into spaces that used to contain components like the diodes and discharge resistor. Put together, the white board sits here and the DC to DC converter on top. I want to leave a gap to make sure that the power LED is still visible. The finished PCB looks like that. The 12V connection wires are solid copper and oversized because they help keeping the DC to DC converter in place. The 5V connection goes through two layers of transparent heat shrink sleeving and the connection points to the converter are raised well above the mains reference PCB. It is certainly not pretty, but functional. Let's plug the serial connector in. Yay, the power LED on the left shows that the 3.3 volts are present, so the DC to DC converter and the voltage regulator are working. And if you observe the flashes of the TX and RX LEDs on the right, you can see that the communication with my PC works as well. A quick check of the output of the DC to DC converter. 11.45 or so volts, that's certainly good enough. I plan to put this unit into a larger box with proper main sockets to avoid rigging flying mains leads as much as possible. So I don't need to reuse the original case, but it would be great if I could. And it would also help folks who plan to use it differently. Because of the tight clip mechanism of the case, putting it together is almost as tricky as taking it apart. But it works in the end. So there's no problem in reusing the original case. Everything fits very neatly. Plugging the serial cable in and the power LED comes on, clearly visible now that it's not buried under a dropper capacitor. And the RX and TX LEDs work as well. Here's the finished unit before putting it together. It is a copy of my original power meter with display, right down to the times one or times ten switch for current. Rather than making this video even longer, please check out the other video for an explanation of this feature. And this is how it looks closed up. It's actually quite compact and sturdy, as I already pulled it twice accidentally from the table on its heavy mains power leads. Nothing came loose or broke inside the box or the module itself. The software you see is a program I wrote to display and record readings from the PCEM004T. It runs on Linux and Windows. More about it and the accuracy of the values in a follow-on video, but you can already download it from my GitHub page, link in the description. In there you will also find a link to my Patreon page. Consider becoming a Patreon to support the channel and get early access to videos and exclusive content. Thanks for watching.